lots of different um, sort of thoughts that you can bring when you set aside time to focus on communion. And this morning's going to be a lot less, say, academic than some of our studies, and it's really more of a devotional thought that's been on my heart. And I think this is, <clears throat> I think this is primarily because of our recent study through the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we've been looking at on Wednesday nights. Um, a, a lot of what undergirds that particular topic, we might say, in the Scripture, is the idea, the reality of the body of Christ. And when Paul the Apostle is writing to the Corinthian congregation, now, I don't know how familiar you may be with Paul's letters to the Corinthian church, but they are largely corrective in nature. Now, not, not all Paul's letters are, are corrective in nature, but, but this one is particularly. Um, and there's lots of different things in Paul's letter to the Corinthian church that he is addressing. Uh, you'll notice with me here in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to pick it up this morning in verse 17. And, and, and again, remember, we're, we're kind of picking this up mid-thought, okay? Uh, we're in the middle of a letter. They, these letters weren't, you know, chapter and versified when Paul wrote them. This is like you're <clears throat> in the, getting a letter in the mail and you're turning to page, you know, 10 and starting to read. So I apologize, but I'll try to set something of a context here for us this morning. Paul says in verse 17, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you. What are the instructions that Paul the Apostle is giving? And, and I would say that m most immediately it's what he's talking about in chapter 11. But, but I'd suggest to you that it's really the contents of the entire letter. And if you look at the entire letter of 1 Corinthians, what Paul is really addressing is order in the church. And he addresses a lot of different things. He addresses things like sectarianism. Uh, and that is, you know, sort of, you know, favoring one leader over another. He addresses the roles of men and women. He addresses head coverings. He addresses spiritual gifts. He addresses immorality in the church. Um, all these different things he addresses. And as he comes to chapter 11, he begins to address their conduct at communion. Even at communion, they weren't necessarily behaving the way a body should behave. Now, I'm not here to suggest to you this morning that this, this is applicable to this church body. I, I certainly don't see what Paul is addressing here in this chapter happening in Calvary Chapel, Yuba City. But, but what I'd like to do is use this particular emphasis that Paul brings to just highlight something as we approach communion this morning. So Paul says, again in verse 17, Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you. He was correcting them again. Since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it, for there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. You may remember uh, several weeks ago, really, we talked about, in, in something of a gruesome application from the book of Judges, um, we talked about division in the body of Christ, but, but one of the things that we noted when we looked at that is that this passage makes it clear that there can be a purpose for when division happens in the body. You know, Paul says, hey, I hear there's divisions among you, and, and hey, he says, I believe it. But the interesting thing is, is how he says, at times there need to be divisions in the body of Christ so that those who are approved can be made evident. Those who are the tried and true, those who are staying the course, those who are approved by God can be made evident or become clearly known. Therefore, he says in verse 20, when you come together in one place, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper, because in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of the others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I don't, Paul says. Paul says, when you guys come together to celebrate the Lord's Supper, it's not really the Lord's Supper that you're celebrating. And here's how I know you're not truly celebrating the Lord's Supper, because when you come to the table, you're like elbowing people out of the way. 
And you're trying to get to the table before anybody else to make sure that you get the largest hunk of bread and make sure that you don't, you know, not get a cup of wine or whatever it might be. And I love, I love when the Bible is just so clear and you really kind of get the gist or um, the heart or the tone behind what the writer is saying. I love what Paul says in verse 22. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? It's like, is that, you know, or is that really how you're going to, you know, act here at the Lord's table? It's, it's like, I, I think Paul is kind of being sarcastic here. If you've ever read Paul's letters, you do know that Paul, from time to time, does have a tendency to be a little sarcastic. But this reminds me, you know, of times when, let's say as an assistant pastor, or I'll do it now, you know, as a senior pastor from time to time, people will be hanging out maybe on a Wednesday night or, you know, Sunday after church, and they're just talking, and it's wonderful, and it's kind of, you know, it's sweet to see. And, and I hate, you know, booting people out of the church. Um, but, you know, I'll come in from time to time, and I'll, I'll flick the lights, and I'll go, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here, you know? And, and, I'll, and I'll jokingly say, what? Do you people not have homes, you know? And it's a joke, okay? It's a joke. Somebody's going to hear only that part of the message this morning. Somebody's going to grab it in bitterness and like crop it down to make it a viral little snippet that goes out from Calvary Chapel, Yuba City. Mean pastor kicks people out of the church. It's a joke. Now, I think Paul is being a little facetious here when he says of their conduct. You know, some of you guys are just kind of buttoned in line and you're not really thinking about whether or not anybody else is getting food. And, and by the way, most of the time in the early church, their partaking of communion was coupled with what we did last Sunday, an international potluck. It's sometimes what they referred to as an agape feast or a common meal. So their breaking of bread, their taking of the cup would have been in the context of a larger meal. And so this is what Paul's getting at when he's saying, you know, some of you guys aren't really paying attention as to whether or not everybody else has something to eat. You're going through the line first, and if there's a single pizza to split amongst four people, you're taking six slices. Paul is like, no, 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 no. You know, you need to be mindful that there's a body here that is going to be partaking of that same meal. So let's just keep reading. This is kind of not really the overall application that I want to make. Paul says, and he begins to highlight here what he had received from Jesus. And of course, he hearkens back to that last supper that we think of Jesus having with his disciples as he's gathered with them on the night that he was betrayed and ultimately crucified. Paul says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this to remember me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And in that particular instance, Jesus took what in the minds of the Jews of his day, Jesus takes a centuries-old observance, a centuries-old tradition, and he gives it an entirely new meaning. Up to this point, the, the bread was representative of, it was the afikomen in, in the Passover meal. And it was a, a single slice of bread that was removed from a linen envelope that had three compartments. And the middle sheet was removed by the father of the family. And it's broken, wrapped in a linen napkin, and it's hidden until the end of the meal when the youngest member of the family would go look for it and find it and bring it back to the Father. Jesus says, this is my body. And you think about Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one, the second person of the Trinity, leaving heaven, coming to earth, his body being broken, wrapped in linen wrappings, hidden away for three days. And who was the disciple that went to the tomb first? It was John, the youngest. It's an amazing picture. And Jesus says, this is my body. And Jesus takes a specific cup, the cup of blessing in the Seder meal. 
which represented up to that point the blood of the Passover lamb. The lamb that God had told Moses and Moses told the people was to be slain and the blood applied to the doorposts and the lentils of everybody's home in Egypt when the death angel was about to go through. And, and listen, it didn't matter if the people inside the house were good or bad. All that mattered was had they put their faith in what God had provided, which was the blood of a lamb. And they would be spared. They would be saved. Jesus said, this is my blood. I mean, can you imagine what the, the, the tone or the mood of that room must have been as Jesus was taking these things that they were so familiar with, that they had grown up their entire lives celebrating, and Jesus rebranding it to speak of him. Now, we'll come back to that in a little bit. But Jesus says, whenever you do this, do it to remember me. And, and have you ever noticed how we have a tendency to forget the things we should remember, and we have a tendency to remember the things we should forget. I love the fact that Jesus actually gives us something, and he says, when you remember me, I want you to do this. He actually gives us, we might think of as like teacher's aids. He says, this bread will remind you of me. And I love the fact that, that Jesus gives us a, a physical element so that when he says, when you remember me, it's not just about doing it in your mind. It, it is partially in your mind and in your heart. But he says, I'm going to give you something that you can touch, something that you can see, something that you can taste. And I want you to involve your senses in remembering what I've done for you. And the bread's broken. It's pierced. It's bumpy. It's got dark marks on it as if someone were bruised. And he says, that's my body. And he says, and I want you to take this cup. And I want you, as you drink it down and taste its sweetness, and you smell it, and you see it, I want it to remind you of the sacrifice, the physical sacrifice that was paid to cover the debt of our sin. It's truly powerful, communion is. Now, Paul goes on. He says, as often as you eat this bread, verse 26, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. I love the fact that the word proclaim there means preach. He says, as often as you do this, whenever you take communion, you know what you're doing? You're preaching. When Scripture says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, a lot of Christians say, well, you know, I don't really know how to preach Here's the good news. This morning, you have an opportunity to preach. When you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're preaching. You're preaching the gospel. You're proclaiming the gospel. And, and, and let me use this as an opportunity to remind us all this morning. You know who needs to hear the gospel? The people in this room. The gospel, it's, it's a little bit like repentance, right? So often, we think of repentance as something that only non-believers need to do. We think if those people would just repent. Now, that's true in one sense, but the reality is you and I need to be living lives of repentance every single day. To repent simply means to turn around, to have a change of mind. If you've ever performed a U-turn in your car, I do this a lot when I'm driving with my kids, if we have to make a U-turn, I'll say, hey, kids, do you know what I just did? And they'll go, turn around. And I'm like, that's exactly right. Do you know what that means? Repent. And I use it as a teaching opportunity. I'm like, that's what it means to repent. Your, your life is going in this direction. You turn around. You repent. Listen, on a daily basis, my mind can start going in a direction where I think, you know what? I need to turn around. My mouth can start going in a, dire a direction where I think, you know what? I need to do a U-turn here. I need to turn around. And, and repentance is something that should characterize our lives. And the reason that I sort of make that comparison is that so often we think of the gospel as something that only lost people out there need to hear. Now it's true, they do. But I'll tell you who else needs to be reminded of the life and the sacrifice and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the incredible payment he made 
for our sins. It's you and me, man. The church ongoingly needs to be reminded, experiencing afresh that revelation of what Jesus did for us. Because if we're not careful, so many other things start to define our Christian existence. You know, we think getting married is, is what kind of the goal of the, of the Christian life. Or we think, you know, being healed of a sickness is the goal of the Christian life. You know, or, or we think getting a promotion or, or the Lord just kind of orchestrating certain circumstances to work out in our favor. That that's what this whole thing's about. What this whole thing's about is Jesus Christ paying for our sin. And when we live being reminded of that fact, we're so bold over at his goodness that it completely and radically permeates the way we think, the way we speak, the way we view other people, the way we interact, our attitudes, our goals, our motivations, our priorities. And it's on that note of kind of how it affects the way we see other people that I want to begin to divert a little bit this morning because this is kind of where Paul goes. He says in verse 27, with what we just talked about as context, he says, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup because he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself not discerning the body i say not discerning the body and skip over intentionally the lord's body because lord's there does not appear in the original grammar it's not discerning the body now look i don't want to get into a big theological argument with anybody that's not my heart this morning uh, of course, it'll probably happen, but that's not my intention. You know, theology is a tricky thing. I was saying to somebody this past week, I once heard theology defined as it's a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat, and he finds one. That's theology. Not here necessarily to talk theology this morning, but I, I will say this, that, that when I was growing up, the general emphasis of this passage was that before you take communion, buddy, you better make sure that there ain't nothing wrong in your heart. Because if you don't, and you come up here and you take this, now listen, I'm, I'm not here this morning to suggest that we shouldn't make sure we've got our hearts right before the Lord before we take partake of communion. But, but let me suggest this to you. If what this passage is talking about is that before you come up here, you better make sure there's absolutely no sin in your life before you partake of this. Can I just ask a question? Who did Jesus die for? God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Does it really match up that God, Jesus, would pay the penalty for all of our sin when we had done nothing to make our hearts right? And, and he died physically on a cross. We didn't have to do anything to clean up our heart or clean up our mind or clean up our life. He loved us so much that he looked at us and he said, there's nothing you can do, and that's why I'm going to die in your stead so that you can be reconciled back to me. If he was willing to die a physical, tormenting execution on the cross when we hadn't done anything to clean up our hearts, why would we have to clean up our hearts before we come up here and eat bread and drink juice? Let me suggest this to you, that in the context of what Paul is talking about, okay, what was, what was Paul talking about a moment ago, back in verse 17? He said their conduct at the Lord's Supper was when they were coming to the table, they were only thinking of themselves. They were butting people out of the way, and you were making sure that you ate and you drank before anybody else, and that's where Paul said, do you not have homes to eat or drink in? So he says, 
don't come to this in an unworthy manner. And, and I would suggest that the unworthy manner is consistent with what Paul's addressing in the larger context of the chapter. And that is the unworthy manner that we don't want to come to the Lord's table is, is self-serving. Is, is only thinking of ourselves and not taking into consideration the needs of other people. Let me sort of flesh this out for a moment with an illustration. If you come to communion to remember Jesus' physical sacrifice on your behalf, his bruised, pierced, broken body, and drink of the juice that represents the blood that was poured out to make you free and clear of every sin you've ever done wrong. Okay, if, if you come up here today to partake of this, and all the while, in the back of your mind, you're holding a grudge against another member of the church, that's an unworthy manner. Because what you're saying is, is that you recognize this covers every sin you will ever commit. Can I just tell you? This covers every sin that that person you hold a grudge against has ever committed as well. And if God has forgiven them, why haven't you? See, that's the unworthy manner. It's like that servant who's forgiven that incredible debt, right? And he falls down before his master and his master is like, pay me what you owe. And he's like, I can't, right? Please don't take my wife and my kids and put them in jail. And the, the master forgives him. And then that servant immediately goes out and he finds his fellow servant and he grabs him by the collar and he says, pay me what you owe. And the guy can't and he throws him in jail. And when the master finds out about it, he's like, how, how could you be forgiven such an incredible debt and not show the same grace to other people? And this, this is what I think sometimes can cripple or plague the body of Christ is that we want to be forgiven. And look, we accept that we've been forgiven. Oh man, I come to communion this morning and I celebrate that all my sins, the things I think and say and ever might have done or even will do that I'm not even aware of, I know I'm going to blow it in the future. Man, I want the grace that God's given me. But so often we find that so hard to extend to somebody who borrowed a DVD and didn't get it back to us on time. Or who borrowed our car and spilt coffee in it and didn't go get it cleaned professionally before they returned the car to us. Or spent the night at our house and cleared out our refrigerator and my favorite cheese that I went, you know, across town to pick up. And this is more of a confession now for me than anything. <laughs> you know, I just, just want to clear the air before I come to communion this morning and say, no, I'm padre, hijo. And, you know, it's, but you understand what I'm saying? Like, we, when you think about, in comparison, the things that we so often hold a grudge a a about or against someone for, it, it pales in comparison to our own vileness and our own wickedness and the things that we've done wrong. Paul says, look, you need to understand the body. That person, they're a member of the body of Christ. We are, Paul says in Ephesians, and this is a very thought-provoking statement, of his flesh and of his bones. You, you're, you may be a hand. The other person may be a foot or an eye or an ear or a, a small toe, right? But listen, if we're all part of the same body and the whole body has been forgiven, then you as a hand have had the same debt paid for you as the small toe. So we can't want it to apply to us, but then not extend it or, or see that it applies to everybody else. And for me, communion, if nothing else, becomes more of a time to check my heart towards others and my attitude towards others. Hey, married couples, this becomes real applicable, right? For us as married couples. And, and sort of all joking aside, right? 
this is kind of a time of confession for me. My wife will tell you, my kids will tell you, I, I get, I, a dirty house really bothers me. And it's mainly because I'm OCD, you know? And everybody's going, oh, this is all starting to make sense now, right? I thought there was something a little off with you as a pastor. You know, you see me come up here before I teach and I start going like this, right? Who moved my cheese, right? <laughs> And it's like, I want God to forgive me of the, the depths of my vile, wicked heart. But I'll go home and get angry that the cabinets have been left open in my kitchen. And I'll get bitter about it. See, I can't do that. That's got to get out of there if I really want to embrace this for what it is. That's my encouragement this morning, is that before you come up here, in just a moment, the band's going to come up, and we're going to close this with a time of communion. I don't want you to think this morning that, okay, you know, you better make sure that you get all your I's dotted and your T's crossed and every last little sin's got to be confessed. I'm not saying don't do that. My encouragement, though, to you more in the context of Paul's chapter this morning is that we approach communion with a healthy understanding of the body. And if you have anything in your heart towards another person, person, a hurt, a wrong, bitterness, unforgiveness. Listen, just forgive them. And I don't even mean we do this so often as Christians, myself included. We say, God, help me forgive that person. That's not what God said. God said, you forgive them. The prayer this morning isn't, God, help me forgive that person. The prayer this morning is, God, I forgive that person. See, it, see, if I say, God, help me forgive, and then I continue to not forgive them, well, then whose fault is it really? It's God's, right? Because I asked him to help me, but he didn't. So he must want me to hang on to that hurt for a while, right? Jesus says, you forgive people. My spirit, the same spirit that forgave you of everything, lives inside of you. I'm in you. I've already given you the power and the ability by my spirit to forgive that person. You just need to extend it to that person. And we need to stop hanging on to stuff that gets in between us in the body of Christ, the, the petty differences, the personality quirks. Sometimes it's not even sin. It's just, I don't like that guy's sense of humor. They parked their car behind me, and I don't like that. Okay. What does that mean? You know, people come into my office sometimes, and and I, you know, I don't want to be rude as a pastor, but there's times when people like pour out their heart and they tell me stuff and I look at people and I go, and what do you want me to do about that? Kevin, my wife's not talking to me. Should I send her a text message? I mean, what, <laughs> what do you want me to do? You know what I mean? It's like, oh, three years ago, this person looked at me weird. I'll order a facelift. I'll make sure they don't look at you that way ever again. You know what I mean? And it's like, if we could all just start to get along. No, if we could all just like understand that we are all united. And li listen, this extends beyond the four walls of this church to people who go to other churches who might have hurt you or you think done you wrong, which I guess is kind of a Southern way of saying that. You think might have wronged you. This, this calls for healthy, healthy introspection. And this is what Paul is getting at here. He says, verse 31, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. But if anyone's hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I'll set in order when I get there. Eating and drinking with an understanding of the body. 
Yes, the body, the physical body of Jesus Christ that was broken for us, but also the body, the body of Christ. And do we readily extend the forgiveness, the grace that's so offered, that's so freely offered to us in what this represents? Do we extend that to other people? I think that needs to be our examination this morning. So what I'd like to do is invite the worship team to come back up, and we're going to play a couple of songs. And here's what I would encourage you to do. We're not going to pass out the communion elements. These are going to be up here freely available for you. Now, sometimes when we do this, what we do is we, we encourage people to come up and take of the bread or take of the cup and then go back to your seat and just take of the bread and the cup as the Lord leads. What I want to encourage you to do this morning as you've spent some time sort of meditating and mulling this over and allowing the Spirit to minister to your heart. When you're ready, you come up and you take the bread and you take the cup. But when you go back to your seat, hang on to it. Because then we're all going to take it together at a certain time. So let's dim the lights back there, Dave, and let's just pray. Father, we love you so much. And we just pray in Jesus' name that you would meet us here in this time of communion. And Lord, look. At the end of the day, if one disagrees about what this passage means or what another passage might mean, at the end of the day, what we want to be here this morning to acknowledge is the sacrifice that you made for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you allowed your physical body to be broken on our behalf. Thank you, Jesus, that you allowed thorns to be pushed into your brow and your back ripped apart and nails piercing your flesh, blood and water gushing from your side to fashion for yourself your own special people, a church, a holy nation, zealous for your good works, Lord. Pray that you meet us here today, and we pray that as we set aside this time to remember and celebrate what communion is, Come now, be in our midst. Jesus, I pray that you would bring to remembrance anything this morning that we may need to let go. Grace, forgiveness, we may need to extend. We hear it talked about all the time, Lord, but when we forgive, it it sets us free. Father, I just pray for our church that we're not a church, we're not a body that's held back and restricted by any unforgivenesses we might not let go of, any bitternesses. Heal, I pray this morning, Jesus. Reconcile. We love you. Pray these things in your name. Amen. Let's all stand as we begin to worship the Lord. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond our measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss the father turned his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man of my sin upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my knocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until accomplished his dying breath has brought me life by 
filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, pray at the naming water, search your mind. Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread together. Jesus, we thank you that you are the bread from heaven. And if we come to you, we'll never be hungry. That you have provided for our deepest need through your sacrifice and reconciling us to yourself. Thank you for your sacrifice for us, Jesus. Thank you for being born, for inhabiting a physical body Because without inhabiting a physical body, you couldn't have had blood. Blood couldn't have been shed. Our sin couldn't have been paid for. Just amazed at the plan of God and how you've provided for our salvation. We're humbled. God, I pray that as we pause for a few moments now on a Sunday morning, that this will set the tone for the rest of our day, the rest of our week. In the same manner, Paul said, Jesus took the cup after supper and he said, this cup is the new covenant, the new covenant in my blood. We're no longer bound to that old covenant. And he said, whenever you drink this, as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup this morning. God, we're reminded this morning of that old song, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? 
And Father, we confess to you this morning that we spend so much time in pursuit of other things that we hope will satisfy and make us whole. But it's when we come to you, when we reorient our lives around the cross, and there we're reminded that you didn't just tell us about your love, you showed it to us. You demonstrated it for us. Everything truly does begin to just kind of fall into perspective, Lord. And I pray for each of us today, fill us up afresh with your spirit. We confess our sin to you. We confess our unrighteousnesses to you. We bring all of that to you, and we just ask for your blood to clean us up afresh. Our attitude, our, our mouths, our desires, all of that in us that's just off and ungodly. Fill us up afresh right now with your Holy Spirit. Help us to walk in the power of your Spirit, celebrating that newness of life that you've given us, God. We celebrate the sacrifice of Jesus this morning. We love you. Thank you for communion. Thank you that we have this in your word. Thank you that you gave us physical elements by which we could remember you. We love you, Lord. I pray you watch over us as we go our separate ways. I, I pray as we go our separate ways that your grace resides over all of our relationships, our marriages, our relationships with our kids and our neighbors and our co-workers and extended family and people in the church, people in other churches, our attitude towards government or people who have different political views than we do, whatever it might be, Lord, may your grace, your amazing grace so affect us and so alter us that it affects the way we see other people and interact and speak to other people. We love you, Jesus. We need you. And we confess that to you this morning. Thank you for this time to be together this morning, assembled as your church. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys, have a wonderful week. We're going to close with one more song. But uh, we hope to see you later this week. Feel free to hang out. Before long, I'll come around and flick the lights and tell you it's time to go home. <laughs> and I will see the sun above, sing along. God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down. Just to know that you are near is enough. God of heaven, come down.
right, you guys are free to go. Have a great week. It was good to, to get to worship with you guys this morning. Take care. Heaven.